And this is a So I'm going to talk a little bit about my early work, uh, what's on display from the permanent collection, or pieces from 1966 to 1980. Let me just backtrack and say that obviously a lot happened prior to 1966. I went to art school when I was seven. Uh, I went to the Corcoran Saturday um, classes when I was 10. I had private lessons when I was 15. We kind of ran out of options. and. Um, my mother's suggestion, we went to American University and submitted my slides and talked to the chairman of the department and he accepted me to take summer art classes at American University. So I started doing that when I was 15. And then um, once I was in the system with the university, no one said I couldn't continue to take classes. So I would leave high school um, right after lunch um, and go to um, afternoon classes at the university, plus I would take evening classes. So I did that, and then um, um, I went to Europe when I was 16 years old, and I studied in Venice, I studied in Austria uh, at the Salzburg International Academy of Art uh, under a famous um, Italian artist named Emilio Vedema. And um, um, I came back very inspired and very influenced, of course, and he was one of these kind of painters, and. I was too, but I started doing discipline work. And I started doing, getting my first studio outside of the house, because I had a driver's license then. And I started making these large kind of um, paintings, construction shapes, Russian influence maybe, it felt like, uh, on uh, sheets of plywood. So they would be eight feet by eight feet. And um, I got a little bit of attention um, because I was at American University, and. And so the head, uh, Nesta Dorrance, uh, who was the director of the Jefferson Place Gallery, which was the prestigious gallery in Washington, D.C., they showed uh, Gene Davis, Sam Gilliam, Rockman Krebs, um, um, and uh, Ken Nolan, people like that. So um, they, uh, Nesta came to my studio, was very impressed, and said, I'd like to put you in a two-person show for the next year. I went back to Europe. And because I had limitations of materials, I, I ended up just, you know, big brushes, black and white paint, doing a lot of abstract expressionist black and white paintings. I think Nesta was a little bit disappointed, uh, but it was a fairly decent show. And one thing I did um, was I painted on, um, some of them were painted on plexiglass, which is interesting. Because usually you paint, and you paint another stroke, and another stroke, and you do your finished strokes. Well, when you paint on glass or plexiglass, your first stroke is not the bottom, it's on the surface. 
and as you keep adding paint, it gets into the background. So it's a very interesting process. Anyway, I had that show, but I wanted to get out of abstract expressionism. I wanted to get away from American University, which was doing figurative art, um, teaching, and still lifes, very traditional in many ways. And I was influenced by certain things going on in the international world, and in Washington, we had the Washington Color School. Personally, I'm not a colorist, but I love the minimal aspect of the Washington Color School. I was somewhat more influenced by people like Frank Stella, who was just doing his very simple paintings in those days. So these works, I'm like 18 years old, and um, I started simplifying shapes. Now, you just have to realize that if you spent years being taught about composition and balance and, you know, movements, and all of a sudden you do a painting with two or three shapes, it's quite, it's quite radical. And um, so then I started making sculptures. And the first sculpture, there's one that's in the back room, uh, my first sculpture that actually I had built. Uh, I found someone who was sort of a carpenter and did on the side. And I think this one was also uh, partially or mostly built by someone else. Then I decided I needed to learn the process. I had never done carpentry work. I'm not mechanical. I was sort of trained to be a painter. And so I started making this gigantic shape in my studio, and I had a miter, you know, a cross saw and a miter box, and cutting frames, and I started cutting wood, and I started making this gigantic structure, and it was so much work. And then someone said to me, you know, they've got power tools. I mean, listen, this is how little I knew back then. And so I got all excited and went back and forth between Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward, and for the young listeners, you probably don't know those names. And I bought my first radio arm saw. And all of a sudden, I could put lumber, go press a button, and go zzzz, and cut, just like that. It was a miracle. So I got more and more uh, into uh, woodworking and, and making things, and, and how things are constructed, and what tools to use. And often I learned things the hard way, but I spent many, many hours doing it. And some of these sculptures would touch, almost touch three walls of my studio. I had a very small studio. So I started making these very minimal things. Uh, Walter Hopps, who I got to know a little bit back then, and then we became very close um, years later, um, always remarked that what made my sculptures different, he came from California, and the California school, there were people doing, not, I won't say similar things, but in some ways similar. But he said what was interesting about my work was, and this is because I was a painter initially, is that I would take big shapes and then divide up the shapes with paint. So I would use the illusion and, and colors and shapes to divide up or change the physical shape. Um, what you're not seeing in this show, I did a few of them after I did these sort of minimal canvases, is that I also, painted, um, I, I did long stretchers and, and used stripes, that was his stellar influence. And I'd have a long shape on the wall and then coming down and then off the wall and then coming along the floor and up. So I really, even back there in 67, just the beginning of 68, I started doing uh, simple constructions and it was canvas and it was paint, but it came out like sculpture. So. So I built these things, and um, I was getting quite a bit of, um, a lot of compliments from people in, in the museum world and the art world of Washington. And then I got, you know, I don't know, I was young, I wanted to experiment, and I was off in a group show at the uh, Jewish Community Center. And I should have just put these sculptures in. I would have gotten sensational reviews. But instead I had this new idea, and I started building this crazy kind of, black and white, odd shaped thing, two sculptures. And they were not well made, I don't think, but they needed a block on the floor in order for it to not collapse. And I put that in the show instead of these very solid works. And I got one of the worst reviews in the Washington Post that I think I've ever read. Maybe one other artist got a worse one. So if you can survive that kind of thing, you can survive anything. Um, two years later or something, I had a one person show up at the Jefferson Place and the same critic raved about my work. So things can change. But anyway, these are works that I did and uh, 
they haven't been shown in, in, in 50 years until this um, presentation at the, um, at the museum here. So now we'll go to the next phase of my life. So I mentioned that I did these, these two crazy sculptures and, and got a bad review. Other things were going on. I was, you know, I was 18 years old, um, possibly into being 19. I was um, having a lot of emotional issues. I was having a lot of growth issues. I was doing very mature work, but balancing that in my life. And um, I, had, I was living by myself. I had a, uh, a townhouse that was a bargain in Washington that served as a studio, a place to live. I was taking classes at American University. And I just, I just, um, I don't know. I just, I needed to get out of Washington. I needed an escape. I needed a change of scenery. I needed to go someplace. I had studied uh, two summers in, in Europe by myself and traveled in Europe. And language is not that much of a problem when you're traveling. But I decided I needed to go someplace and work. And I wanted to get away from the Washington art scene uh, and away from my life in Washington. And so I had never been to England, but I figured logically it wouldn't be a language problem there. So I packed up my bags. And let me tell you something. In those days, you could get away with it. I had a carry-on bag that was actually very large. And I put my compressor in there, and my spray equipment in there, and some power tools, and a big transformer because England has different electricity. And this bag, I think, weighed over 100 pounds. And, and we had to walk a long distance in the terminal. And Passengers looked at me because I'd walk 100 feet and could barely carry this bag. And somehow I got the bag and my clothes and I don't even remember where or how, but I found a place to stay and then I looked for a studio. And I couldn't find a studio because I was looking for commercial space. And landlords wanted five-year leases and they wanted uh, references and they wanted, uh, you know, two or three months um, deposit. I couldn't do that. And so I ended up meeting some artists. If you meet one artist, you get invited to something, you meet other artists. And I was, I think I was in London for about a month and I was just giving up. And I, I had this crazy idea to go to Africa, like a little gym thing and just find adventure or something. It wasn't going to work in London. And I was at this artist party and um, someone said, well, talk to Philip King. And now Philip King is a very well-known British sculptor. And he was in the Venice Biennale that year. And I went up to Philip King and I said, you don't know me and I don't want you to feel pressured, but if I can't find a studio today or tomorrow, I, I just, I'm giving up, I'm leaving. And he said, look, I've got four studios and one, one of them I'm not using. So I'll let, I'll sublet it to you. So that's how I found a studio in London. I couldn't make sculptures. I couldn't do big things because, you know, a limitation of, 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 Everything from storage to, to, to um, equipment and, and everything. So instead of making sculptures, I started to make paintings about sculptures. And I taught myself um, perspective. And actually, when I came back to the United States, I became the expert in, in perspective and one point, two point, three point perspective. But then I wasn't so serious on the exact size perspective. I was trying to create three-dimensional sculptural shapes or images that either in an interior space or on a grid or over there that one uh, I did a series with sort of landscaping backgrounds. Uh, in, in the news where the studio was, I met David Zaig, who's an artist who uh, he lives in North Adams and we're still close to the, this day 50 odd years later. I mean, so David and I are still close. It's funny how uh, things um, continue uh, after 50 odd years. But anyway, David had a studio there and uh, there were a few other artists. Um, uh, Robert Adams, who's a very well-known British artist. Um, 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 Huxley had a studio, uh, quite well-known, and a couple other artists. And uh, there was a sign company there. And there was a fiberglass company there. And the sign company made things out of metal and engraving. So I got to learn how to engrave on plexiglass and um, use their equipment making signs to make this sculpture, which I never really completed until um, this exhibition. I finally put the signs in. Uh, I just, it's been, it wasn't painted and it was lying around the studio. And it's kind of a shame, but this is from 1968 in London. 
and all these paintings in 1968. So after less than a year, I had to make a decision, either stay in London and make that my home, but I had no job, I had no prospect for income and, and, and long-term uh, working, um, or come back. And so I decided that to be serious in my art, I needed to return to the United States. So now I'll show you what happens. So I left London and um, I took a uh, ship back to the United States because I had all this stuff that accumulated and I met Barbara on the ship and we've been married for 51 years so that was quite a change in my life. I came back to the United States, I reclaimed my townhouse which I had sublet and um, started working and started really settling down and getting into it. And so I came up with this, this is called the dormers, you know, it's like a dorm or a house, it's so K-shaped. Um, and um, Tom Downey was doing some shape um, canvases. Uh, he's a famous Washington Coast School artist. And I knew, everyone knew each other in Washington. It was a small world and I, and I was with one of the best galleries, so I was respected. And Tom knew of this carpenter, he was very reasonable and a few blocks away from my studio. So I don't even remember how I did. I might have given them paper patterns or something. But these are cut out shapes, the masonite, and then they're framed in the back. Then I would get it and stretch canvas over and go through this very tedious, tedious process of painting each shape with two or three layers of paint. Uh, this piece weighs probably 200 pounds. And it's actually in six sections that bolt together. So I started doing the dormers, and I worked very hard doing these. And I ran out of space in my townhouse, so I was able to get a studio um, um, again in, in, in this apartment building nearby. And so I had two studios. I felt really successful. And then I was also teaching art at the Corcoran. I started, um, the way you get into the Corcoran as a faculty is they say, oh, teach the Saturday Children's Program. And I did that, and I was very successful, but then I started teaching uh, substitutions for the adult classes, and then finally, uh, I think the second year, I was teaching a, uh, a, a drawing class to adults. And half the students, it's very interesting, I, I think I was 22 years old, uh, 21, and half the students in my class were GW students, and most, almost everybody was older than I was, because I taught a lot of evening classes. So that was a very interesting experience, but I really worked hard on these paintings. And then I showed them in uh, the Jefferson Place Gallery in 1969, and basically to rave reviews. And um, um, I think that's why um, they wanted me to teach at the corner, and they, they really respected my work. So, so these were very tedious paintings to make, and they were very heavy. And, um, and finally I got, after a year and a half, two years, uh, this is sort of normal for a lot of artists who work for a couple of years and then you kind of run dry like you've done enough variations and different ideas and you feel like you want to do something a little bit more dramatically uh, different. So I decided to get away from these heavy shaped canvases and I went back for the first time in years to traditional rectangular um, canvases and we'll see that in the next so these are the grid series. Um, I started doing this in 1970, uh, mostly 1970, 71, um, for almost all of them. I think maybe a couple of them uh, got to 72, 1972. Where I came up with the idea, I don't know, but I was always looking at materials. I remember looking at, at screening and, and grid, uh, metal grids, uh, fencing, and, and, and in metal shops, wherever in Washington DC I would wander, not just art stores, I love to go into industrial places and look at materials. So I started finding this idea of, of, of a grid where you can see through it. And what happens is that you're actually looking at more space than the grid. The grid's narrow. So underneath there's another grid. And then through that there's a background of space. Um, I'm not sure, I think in this painting over here, I had three layers of grids. So I started to do these large things, and there were a lot of them, 18 feet. I think the largest um, was 22 feet wide, 
And they were very difficult to do. First of all, I started just doing it with all paint. But in my wanderings, I found this vinyl chip material. It's a floor material. And, you know, I always joke, it's like doing uh, point utilism the easy way. You know, instead of, if, if you want green, you can use green paint, or you can do dots of blue and dots of yellow. And from a distance, it'll look like green, because it'll all merge in your, in your vision. Well, in this case, I can take a handful of yellow chips and a handful of blue chips and sprinkle them together, and I can create new kinds of color combinations. The other thing I can do with the chips is I can make them smaller. So maybe on the surface, some of these chips are larger, like they're closer to you, and in the background, they might be smaller. If I want more distance, for example, I can separate the colors. If I want to bring the grids together, I can use the same, some of the same colors in the background and, and, and include them in the foreground and bring space together. But to me, going to rectangular canvas meant that these were windows. You're looking through a window into this vast grid. Uh, to me, they were like space grids, outer space grids in some ways, uh, not necessarily physical things on the earth. Um, and there was a lot of things in the literature about black holes and space time and all. And I like this idea of barriers. The barriers were very strong, very um, sort of an offensive thing to put a fence in you where you can't cross it. And today, in today's political world, it continues. So these are very meaningful to me. So I started using grids, and then you can see I used, uh, I mean, the chips. And then I used paint on the side, uh, at least in these three canvases. But very soon after this, I, I just used all chips. And I'll tell you one other thing. Every time I do something, it seems like it's going to be tedious. So in order to do the chips, which is a um, resin, a base coat, and you put the chips on, and then you put a glaze on your thing on the top, I had to make the stretcher with plywood in it, so it would have a hard surface. And then you couldn't just pull off the tape. Um, because the chips would be ragged. So you had to take a razor blade and cut through the chips, but not through the canvas. And whoever would help me, we all made trips through the emergency room because I would use a thin piece of metal, um, like a ruler, but a long ruler, and sometimes a razor blade would skip and hit the thumb. And then the other tedious thing about it was that here you can see I'm using perspective. So I would do on graph paper my drawings and I built in our apartment at the time uh, so I could be home with Barbara and not be all the time in the studio a 10 foot long table where I would do my drawings so if my my rulers that would stick out several feet I could go hit my my vanishing points so then after I would do this detailed pencil drawing I would have a copy stand so the camera would be straight down 90 degrees to take a picture of this drawing. Then I would get it developed, but it would be developed on a glass slide. I couldn't use a regular slide because then I would, in my studio, I had a wall with a track so that the slide projector would be at an exact 90 degree angle to the canvas. And then I would project my slide. And with a 16 foot pieces of metal rulers, 16 feet long, in some cases, when I'm doing big paintings, I would hold them up and draw lines. It would be easier with a helper, so one person could hold one side and one as the slide is being projected on the canvas. That's why I needed a glass slide, because it would take two or three hours to trace this drawing, and a regular slide would buckle under the heat in a few minutes, so a glass slide could survive three hours. Once it was drawn, then I could transfer this heavy canvas to sawhorses so I could work flat and do my chips and paint and whatever and cut it off and then I would hold it up when I'm finally done with the uh, whole painting and make sure I like it and then we'd go back down again and I would have to unstretch one end and slide out all this plywood and then eventually I would have a finished canvas. A lot of work involved, I, you know, when I think back at it. And I think over the two year period that I did the grids, 1970, 71, um, I did 50 grids. Uh, um, some of them were smaller, of course, but a lot of them were 18 feet um, in size, 16, 18 feet in size. These are not the largest ones on exhibition.
um, I have paintings in, uh, in the collections of various museums in the United States, and several of those paintings came from this period because I got quite a bit of um, reputation from doing the grids. And not only that, um, I was offered a uh, one-person show at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, which is a Corcoran Museum. And so I showed my large grids, and um, um, I showed one new work that I that the grids finally, after two years, like I told you in the dormers, you want to change, I, I decided I wanted to break up the grid. So I started painting uh, the grid broken with pieces. And then I decided, you know what, I wanted more freedom. So I wanted to go back to odd shape constructions on the wall. And that's what you would do. So, quite a change from rectangle grid paintings. What happened was I was taking those grids, breaking them apart, I had pieces, planks. So I started fooling around with just the planks. And I said, I want to do this. You know, I had it sort of in my mind, I want to do this. How to do it? Well, my only other experience making um, um, odd shape uh, wall things were doing, cutting them out of masonite and framing each one as, oh my God, all that carpentry work, and that's going to weigh so much. And I said to myself, okay, if I have the masonite, could I put something lighter without having a heavy frame behind it? And I thought, could I take masonite and, and styrofoam and sandwich it together? And then I thought, why have masonite? Why not just go with the styrofoam? So I started getting styrofoam, and I did two paintings of styrofoam. But as you can see, I'm still using chips, you know, and resins and all. And guess what? When you put resins on styrofoam, it melts the styrofoam. And I said, oh my goodness, this is not going to work. So then, living in Washington, D.C. in those days had a lot of advantages. Um, telephone calls were very expensive, long distance calls in those days. Uh, younger people might not know that, but they were very expensive. But every corporation had a government office in Washington, D.C. And I could call up, you know, General Electric or, or Owens Corning or Corning or Dow Corning, and I'd say, look, I need some advice. And they would switch me, transfer me to some other place in the United States where I could get some technical help. And it wouldn't cost me more than a local phone call. And so someone said to me, you know, there's another phone called urethane phone. And it will be OK with the chemicals that I'm using. Well, there's a whole new investigation. And it turns out that that I have to explain a little bit about foam, it's interesting. Styrofoam is made individual sheets and the bubbles are kind of smaller on the surface, so it's very stiff. Urethane foam, they, use, they also make it in big sheets, but they make it like a gigantic bread bun, you know? And then they slice it into slices of bread. And what happens with bread, it's, it's very limpy, you know? Uh, because you don't have that skin to give it virginity. So how do you have foam that's cut this way to be stiff? Well, you have to have very dense foam, just like dense bread. So dense foam is more expensive than lighter foam. And so it was quite expensive what I was trying to undertake. Well, I, I, I got a hold of Owens Corning that made the material, and they made a deal with me to give, sell it to me at their wholesale price in exchange for a painting that they would then donate uh, to a museum or university. So I started doing it, but foam is still kind of not strong enough. So I needed to make it tougher. Now today, I would have done this completely different in a much easier way, but you have to remember, this is back in 1972. I mean, it's oh, decades ago. And I, now all the materials we have today were available then. So I found an epoxy paint, and you mix it with a catalyst, the resin and the catalyst, and you had like 20 minutes or 15 minutes working time before it would stiffen and get hard. So I would take this foam and I would cut it out at angles in the back because I was just dealing with the surface. And I would coat it with this epoxy. Who was that a lot of work? And once it hardened, I had this hard shell that made it quite stiff. So then that was okay, but then I needed to stick one to the other. And I came up with this idea of using dowels. Well, it's the same problem. You drill the hole for the dowel, you're into that soft foam. That didn't work. 
you know, I, I'm telling you, everything I did got more and more difficult. Life didn't get easier. So I would take a, um, I don't remember why I used to cut it out, but I would cut out a whole chunk of foam in the back. And I had this other camera going, polyethylene. And I would have a jig with a, uh, um, with a um, silicone dowel, and I would pour this resin in there and with my dowel and let it stiffen and harden. And after an hour or so, I could pull out the dowel and I would have a receiver for a wood dowel. I mean, and of course, the dowel couldn't be off by half an inch because this one had to be exact to that one, which had to be exact to that one. So all these are put together with dowels, and they're called my plank series because these are planks. But what I did was, which was a, uh, uh, I guess, an uh, echo of the uh, what I started to do in uh, uh, London, and then the dormers, and then the grids. I kept this idea of using an illusion, so it looks like a three-dimensional grid. Okay, they're flat, but they look three-dimensional. But then they're physically in front of the other, and uh, and they come out of the wall maybe up to a foot. And there's a lot of space behind, as you can see. So, so these are all put together. And what was interesting for me in putting together this show was that these planks were, you know, they were getting dirty and chipped and stored in the studio in pieces. And I think that if I had sort of dropped dead, nobody could have figured out how they went. So I'm very really happy because I looked at these things that I hadn't seen in, in 45 years or something. And they look fresh. They look like they were just made yesterday. And I'm quite happy with these um, looking back. But I hadn't seen them except on slides in those many years. So I think they're lively. They look lively. I wanted that liveliness and energy to be there. But behind the scenes, which people don't realize, boy, these were probably the most tedious works I've ever done in my life. Uh, and I hope, <laughs> although I'm still doing tedious, I mean, processes are tedious. Um, you don't whack out great art in, in, uh, in an afternoon. Sometimes it takes some time. So these are my plank series, which I did for uh, two years, mostly in 1972 and 73. And then I had enough. I mean, my, my emotionally, I'm an abstract expressionist. These are energetic, but they're very tedious. And I wanted to get back to something that was a little bit more fun to work with. And so you'll see a tremendously different kind of work that I did next. So I was explaining how I got into polyurethane foam. I would buy sheets of polyurethane foam, have my patterns, cut them up in the saw, rip them, bevel the edges. Then I'd have to put shells and and all kinds of devices and, and new residents to be able to lock them together. It was, a, it was a process that was enough to drive you up a wall. But it was polyurethane foam, and I knew about the material, and I started doing a lot of research. Um, in those days, you could always judge what I was into as to what magazines I was subscribed to. My favorite was called, I think, RSI, which was Roofing, Siding, and Insulation, because Roofing is where you, and insulation is where you would find polyurethane foam used all the time. So, so there was spray equipment. You could actually spray polyurethane foam. And this was like, I needed to try it. Um, and today we have it in cans and all, but in those days we didn't have that. So I heard or found out a contractor in Annapolis, which was about 45 minutes away. And I said, look, would you allow me to do some experiments on a nice day when they're not doing a, a construction job? And they said, yeah, we'll use the equipment and all, but you can come and pay for the time and materials. So one day I drove over and I had things in my mind to this um, outfit. And we laid out plastic on the ground and, and all of a sudden they started spraying. And you spray and it goes, And it, it, you know, every spray will increase 30 times in size, just like that. And so you can start making shapes and making things, like instant. Um, when you think about traditional sculpture, you know, a figure or, or anything, you have to make an armature, you have to put clay or plaster, or you have to chisel. All of a sudden, this was magic. This was magic, you know. Um, <laughs> 
I always had a dream when I was doing abstract expressionism and I would paint like this. One of my dream ideas was to be able to take a brush with colorful paint and go in midair and let it stay there. Well, nowadays you could do that virtually, but you can't physically do it. But foam came close. I could go pick it up and stick it there and it's there. And I just make things like that. I mean, it sounds easy. Everything's easy, but this was like magic. And so I started, I, I, I had to beg, borrow, and steal, and save the money because it was expensive. It was like, I don't remember, I think $5,000, which was like, in today's world, like spending $50,000, $100,000. We didn't have any money. And I had a large studio, and I got the equipment. And, um, and in order to buy the equipment, um, you go up there and you have a three-day training course. Uh, this was Guzmer equipment and they were located in New Jersey. So I went up for three days and I, I got a degree. I, I got a CF, um, certified phone mechanic. And so I came back to the studio I said, I got to do this in a systematic approach. So I started doing reliefs initially, okay? So I started doing these weird shapes and keep in mind, the whole world was going geometric. Walter used to point this out. Very few artists were going organic. I think Tucker was doing some organic sculpture, sculptures, but most artists, um, and this was a, a early mid 70s, they were going geometric. And um, I just love this stuff. So I started making reliefs. And then you have this rough texture, and you have to paint it. So the question was how to paint it. And so I needed to work on that. And some paintings, which I don't don't know whether you'll see it on these two examples, but my wet paint, I was spraying on the paint. And in order to spray these kind of things, I had to get an airless spray gun where I could do heavy paint quickly. And then you could take different colors and, and spray at different angles and would hit the surface in different ways. And then sometimes you could take air and blow out some of the paint that hadn't dried from the crevices. So I started working on how to paint artistically rough surfaces, and this led to all kinds of work uh, many years later. So I started doing reliefs, and uh, in 1974, I had um, a show at the Jefferson Place Gallery where I showed these foam reliefs, and it was quite, quite interesting. But with foam, you can do all kinds of things. You can do figurative work, you can do abstract work, you can do um, uh, sculptures, you can do reliefs, and so I started to experiment with all kinds of processes because no one had ever done this. It's like in today's art world, there are millions of artists, so almost any technique or approach somebody's done, not only somebody, a thousand artists have done similar things. I'm doing something where nobody's done this. So I would take paper and I could shape it, I could spray foam behind it and shape it and make all these things. Well, these are little ones, which they're called uh, frame autogens, and, and um, um, all, a lot of my work we call autogens is a name that Walter Hobbs came up with. It still means an a, a organism that's able to survive on its own, you know, independently. So within this framework, I would make my shapes and put them together. So these are the small frame autogens. And then this whole idea that art, when you take art and you put it on the wall, the wall, the architecture, the floor, the ceiling, it gives it a rhythm and it kind of supports that artwork. Well, I didn't want an architect to be responsible for whether my art is good or bad. I wanted to control it. So that's why I created my own architectural frame to, to make this happen. So over here, I started making sculptures. And as you can see, even though I was doing free stuff, I started doing very tedious work again, where I wanted my own architectural structures to, to house my, my organic shapes. In some cases, they almost have the reminiscent of, of museum cases. So as you can see, I made the foam shapes and they go through the glass or through the solids to the other side. And they were very tedious. I mean, it's very, uh, uh, sometimes when I give a lecture, someone says, well, how did you cut the glass so the shape could come through? Well, obviously it's easier to cut the shape and glue it on both sides. But still, it had to be done just right. And so I did a whole series of um, uh, glass antigens, they're called. And, um, um, and they were shown um, 
the Jefferson Place Gallery had closed. I started doing these in the 1976-77. Uh, I think that one of the earlier ones is the one in the back left. Uh, those two, I think, were uh, 1977, if comes to mind, um, even though it says 78. And, uh, and I started doing it until um, uh, 80, 81. And in 1981, I was then showing with the Diane Brown Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I had a show that Walter Hopps curated um, that showed these glass ontogens and then the small frame ontogens um, in that show. But I was doing at the same time much larger works. And outside, uh, the, uh, outside of this museum on the lawn are two large works. One was sort of a gigantic spider and the other one is a cage piece that I did in the spider, I think it was 76 or 77, and the cage piece was uh, 79. And that was exhibited. That has a whole fun story, which I won't get into, but that was shown at a public outdoor exhibition in downtown Washington, D.C. And then the government got involved and moved it to Constitution Avenue and, and uh, <laughs> created quite a controversy. But it was so popular that a street photographer set up shop and people would have their photos taken in front of my sculpture. So this is how I got into more organic works. Even though a lot of it's controlled, um, a lot of it is very free-formed. And I became really an expert in, in and polyurethane foam. Hollywood uses a lot of it in, in doing the, the, um, some of their sets, but very few artists do it because you need big equipment. And you know about, uh, most people know about foam that you can buy in cans and go and spray it to insulate around a window or a pipe. Well, I would, my foam came in two parts, a resin and a catalyst, and they were 55 gallon drums. So they weighed about 600 pounds per drum. And unfortunately, in those days, my studio didn't have a loading dock. So just to get it off the truck onto the ground so you could hand truck it in was always a big fear that the thing would break or roll down the hill and, and kill hundreds of people. But, but I managed, and I did a lot of work over the years. And um, it's, it's just a fascinating process um, of polyurethane, polyurethane foam. Spray in place, poly, rigid polyurethane Probably the other thing phone is the complete um, um, description of it. And I did, I worked with it for 35 years and finally decided that enough was enough. A lot of chemicals involved, even though I use mask and ventilation and things like that. And I don't use nearly as much as professional roofers and ins insulators uh, do in the, in the commercial world. I decided it was enough is enough. And besides, I got into all kinds of new technologies and, and, and new um, materials. And this is a 